Um, my name is Di Robinson and I'm with the SES in the Community Engagement Unit and I'm facilitating today's meeting. I would like to begin by acknowledging the First Peoples of the Murray River and the Mallee region as the traditional owners of the land and water on which we meet today and I'd like to pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and I would like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live in and visit this beautiful district. So welcome and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to attend this meeting. Um, as I mentioned, I am from the SES and the, the South Australian State Emergency Service and we are a volunteer-based emergency assistance and rescue service who provide emergency assistance 24 hours a day, seven days a week 365 days a year. So if you do need our assistance in an emergency situation, we will respond. Um, we also have about 1,600 volunteers who um, are, sep are in units across 73 different units across the state. The SES is the lead agency for flood, which is why we are facilitating today's meeting. And we do work very closely, we have been working closely with community, other agencies and the local council to manage the Murray River high flow event. Now, today is an information meeting and we have these wonderful speakers from a range of agencies um, who are going to give you an update on what's happening in their particular areas right now. We've got brochures from the SES and also from the other agencies over on the table. And you'll notice that we've also put up some large white sheets. There is a question and answer session at the end of the information session. And we do hope to answer as many questions as we can. But if we can't get to them all or you have a question that you want to ensure is um, passed on to the relevant agency, please take a post-it note from over there and stick it up onto the white um, paper, butcher's paper, and I will ensure that it goes to that agency. And they have been responding to community queries, both on their social media and also on their um, FAQs pages. You're going to hear lots of information today and probably some contact numbers. The key one to remember is sa.gov.au which is a website that's been put together by the state government and all the links to the various speakers we have here today are posted on that website. And there is also a brochure over on the table that will list all those, um, all the agencies that you can, um, and their contact numbers over on the table. The format for today is that we will have the speakers provide an update first and then I'm going to answer a uh, then I will open the floor to questions. Um, I should have mentioned housekeeping. Bathrooms are out the door over there to the left and the exits are clearly marked in case of emergency, but we're hoping nothing like that will happen. Oh, just give me a moment. Now, I just wanted to let you know too that Today's meeting is being live streamed um, by Samuel, who's kindly got that organised for us. Um, so I guess I just want to let you know that yes, we are on live stream and also to the speakers, please when you come up to speak, do speak into the microphone so that our people um, at the meeting today that have attended can hear you clearly and also those on live stream. To start off our information session, I would like to invite Brad Flew, who is the SES Incident Controller, um, to commence our information session. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Di. Um, as Di introduced, I'm Brad Flew, the current Incident Controller from the South Australian State Emergency Service. And first off, I just want to say a, a big welcome and thank you for coming along today. Um, it's really great to see you all here. Um, to get some information and trying to be the best informed we can be uh, for this incident. So I really just want to thank you for coming out today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? If a bit better? Yeah, that's a bit better. I thought it might be. <laughs> thank you. All right, so what I'm going to do is just quickly run through the current situation, um, what we're currently seeing and some of the, act and the actions that we're actually undertaking at the moment. Um, I will just point out that a lot of the information I will touch on lightly and a lot of the other speakers will provide more information as we go through um, the rest of today. 
So what we're currently seeing is we know we've got over 150 gigalitres of water a day um, coming over the border. Um, we're expecting that to peak at over 165 in the early to mid-December and a second peak later on in December, um, which DEW will give us a little bit more information on the forecast shortly. Uh, these are going to be the highest flows since the 1970s and around that mark. So um, whilst that, that terminology has been used a lot, it's just the guide. Um, it's a guide to give some context to some people that have been exposed to that and have been in the community when that occurred. Um, what I really would like to stress is that doesn't mean it's going to behave the same way. So um, the river has changed over time. Um, the topography, where the river is moving, and um, a lot of the things that have, uh, can impact what that flow actually means. So um, whilst it gives us some good context, take it as a, as a guide and an indicator. I'd just like to acknowledge some of the impacts that we're seeing across the entire river communities. Um, we're seeing a number of road closures, um, ferries are starting to be impacted, and these start having an impact on us in the, in the community um, with a lot of things in our day-to-day -day lives, whether this is um, direct impacts with our properties, um, the uncertainty that goes with that, all the way through to simply having to sp spend more time on the road travelling to go to work and, and school and all those sorts of things. So please take the time to be best informed on those, um, take the opportunity to see the best way that you can, you can travel around your commun local community. Um, some of the actions that we're currently undertaking is we have an incident management team established in Loxton. So we have a team of people um, that, that it grows um, as this incident occurs and the, uh, the flows increase over the border. In that incident management team, we work with a number of stakeholders and so local government and um, all the representatives that we have here today. To support the incident management team, there's also something that's called a zone emergency support team. Now that team um, is where all the stakeholders come together and we work collaboratively and ensure we've got communication across everybody that's involved with this incident and feed it through so that we can be as best prepared as we can to inform you guys as a community in what actions we need to take to prepare for this. In terms of some of our public information, um, obviously we're conducting community meetings like these across the entire river length. So we're running them in multiple towns um, and it's great to be here in Barmer today as well to give you guys an opportunity to hear the information straight from us. So thank you for that once again. Uh, we also have alerts and warnings. Um, there's um, some alerts and warnings that have been out for some time now. So flood watch and acts um, for the lower River Murray and the upper River Murray. These warnings will continue and be um, current for some time whilst we're in this emergency. In terms of information and the best way for you to get information, um, as Di mentioned, sa.gov.au is a website that's been set up with feedback from meetings like these and working with the community to have a single source of information that you can refer to to get all the information we're going to talk to you about tonight and other information that's relevant to this. So you'll find all the phone numbers that we talk about on there. You'll find where our relief centres are, sandbag locations, and you've got quick and easy links um, to be able to find all of that. One of the best things for, for preparedness, or one of the good things for preparedness, and it's been something that's been talked about a lot, is our sandbags. Um, sandbagging your property and preparing your property. Um, we've established our six strategic locations across the river um, to allow people to be able to collect sandbags and provide opportunity to be able to fill them as well um, to best to prepare your property. It's important to note if you're going to undertake sandbagging and prepare your property um, that it's a minimalist approach in terms of we don't need to be building significant levee rules and best way to protect your property. The best way to actually protect your property is to sandbag your doorways, vents, drains and any other low-lying area that water can enter your property. That's going to provide the absolute best protection for your property as possible. We'll just bring that up. If you're not sure what, the, um, what sandbags, how to use the sandbags and would like some more information, across on the right we've got some pamphlets that you can grab um, and there's plenty of information on sa.gov.au as well. In regards to what you can do to prepare holistically, it's about understanding what your flood risk may look like. Um, and there's a number of resources, again, on the sa.gov.au website, and you're probably going to get sick of hearing that website today, but that's really the key take-home message of where everything's going to be. But available is some flood mapping. Now, there's some flood mapping to give you an indication of where you may or may not be in, um, impacted. So you can use that, again, as a guide to get an opportunity to see what your risk is and what actions you may need to be able to take. Um, to prepare your property, as I said, sandbags is one, of, is one of the things you can do. But the other things that need to be considered is moving your items from below. So as low, anything you've got down low lying, move those items up as high as possible. And better yet, 
relocate them. If you've got an opportunity to store them in an area that's not going to be impacted, or family, friends, um, neighbours, store your items there to minimise the risk of uh, damage to those. Otherwise, raise them as high as possible to minimise those impacts. In regards to some of the other considerations we have, um, is safe water use. Um, we know you know, we're, you got, it, the community loves, loves the river and the water space, so it's about being able to be safe in those environments and being aware of what the risks are. Um, we ask if you are going to be operating out on the waters, that you understand what your risks are and that you're uh, comfortable and confident to be able to w work in those waters and do. If you're not, then please don't. Obviously, out on the river main itself, there's a lot of current and movement in the water so, and submerged objects, which present a number of risks. So whilst we're asking you, not, we're not saying don't operate out there, but please be aware that you need to be extra vigilant and be aware of what the risks are. Whilst I'm on, on the river and, and water and, and safety, I would just like, really like to stress the risks of playing in flood water. We're seeing a lot of people wanting to take opportunities to play in flood water. Um, it looks like it's fun, it's been hot lately, um, and everybody wants to play in it. Now, the risk of playing in the, in the flood water is essentially to life, and we don't, it can be very deceiving how easily someone can be swept away by some moving water. So I'd really like to just take the opportunity to remind everybody and for you to take messages home to your family and friends about the dangers of playing in flood water. We've seen a number of people playing in, in fast moving water, um, and it's been becoming quite a concern for the community and for us and for the safety of everyone involved. So if I could just ask everyone to keep that in mind in the community as well. There's obviously um, speed limits and other restrictions um, in the marine environment for people operating boats and vessels, and DEW, uh, correction, sorry, Department of Infrastructure and Transport, we'll talk about that in more detail later, I'm sure. Um, also, um, your road closure information, you can grab, uh, there's a website available to you um, through the sa.gov.au, which will give you a map of all the road closures that are in the area, so you can keep yourself informed as well. One of the other safety messages is generators. So there's been concerns about um, people having power isolated and may still be living at home. Um, whilst generators are a great source of power and an opportunity to um, give you those resources that you need or utilities at home, just be aware where you use those generators and make sure they're used in a well-ventilated spa safe space so that the exhaust and things like that aren't running into your home and causing issues for yourself. So maybe a little bit from left field, but um, yeah, please keep that in mind when you're operating. Once we've identified what our flood risk is, it's about now considering what the actions are that you're going to do. Um, obviously, there's some choices that you can make in terms of whether you're going to stay or go. And if you do choose to stay, you need to make a th a some considerations with yourself and your family and your household about what that actually means. Your personal circumstances, medical, social, financial, um, your ability to manage extended periods of isolation, what that means for yourself emotionally, mental health, um, and all those sorts of considerations. The likelihood is, if you're going to isolate and you're going to be inundated with water, you will lose power and most of you, and all of your utilities. So that will mean, in reality, no power, potentially no sewerage, um, and limited communications as well. So it's about understanding that, that before you make your decision. If that does actually happen, how are you actually going to do that and how are you going to make sure you're prepared? But absolutely the best choice is to decide to go and decide to go early. That way we, you know that you're going to be safe, your property is prepared, and you're going to be outside of the risk. Making a decision at the last minute, you need to make sure you carefully weigh that up. If you leave the decision to leave right to the very end, it may not be safe for you to leave. So please make sure you try as best as you can to make the decision early and have those conversations now before you're likely to be inundated for those that are in a flood risk area. There's been some concerns around what happens if we're displaced, if we don't have somewhere to go. And we understand that everybody doesn't have somewhere to go if they can't stay in their own house. So emergency relief centres have been opened, and we have one currently open uh, in Barrie, and future sites will be open as required. Um, there's also a relief hotline which you can um, engage through sa.gov.au and um, talk to relief about options. So in regards to some of the other safety messaging, just before I close, um, monitor the road closures, undertake your, your river use within your capabilities, um, and please, please don't allow children to play in near, near or in floodwaters. Um, I really can't stress that enough in terms of the risk that, that it poses to your family and friends. 
Um, and just in conclusion, um, we're, SES is, is working hard to make sure we communicate with the communities all the time, and we're going to continue to work with you to get the information out that we need to get out to ensure that you guys are prepared for this event. We're, and I can assure you we're working um, and identifying risks and working with different agencies and communities through forums like these, through our um, incident management team and um, other meetings and places where we come together to talk about these sorts of things. Um, and finally, at any stage, the SES is available for flood and, and storm response. We have our 132500 number, which is our, our usual storm and flood response, and in the event of emergency, you can you dial triple zero, and we will be there where we can to respond. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. I don't know if you deserved a round of applause, but it was very good, I must admit. Um, and just reiterating with the sandbagging, there are brochures here, but all the sandbag sites also have um, brochures on how to sandbag, and you'll find that um, the SES crew there will also be able to support you and tell you how to lay them. And also, Brad, thanks so much. I think it's really important that you consider what you need to do. Everybody needs, will have an individual plan on what they need to do during this event, so really start thinking about it and consider it. Um, next we have Chrissy Bloss from Department of Environment and Water. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, so my name is Chrissy Bloss. Um, head, um, uh, from the Department for Environment and Water. My role there is the manager of water delivery. Uh, my day-to-day -day role outside of floods is managing um, the River Murray um, operationally uh, regarding regards to water level and flow, water quality, uh, the barrages in the lower lakes, and working closely with upstream agencies like the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and as well as with SA Water. Um, today I want to talk to you about a few things, talk about the, the flow forecast uh, for the River Murray uh, in the weeks ahead. I uh, want to talk about um, some of the available information that we have regarding flow and water level. Um, might then touch on what we're actually seeing. Um, that's another interesting story in itself. And then to finalize, finally, we'll just touch on um, black water as well. Uh, so the current forecast, um, which uh, was provided um, by the state government uh, last week, was a forecast of um, 170 to 180 gigalitres per day at the border as like a first peak, um, perhaps from rainfall events that occurred. Um, it's really, you know, remember the floods that occurred in, in Victoria, um, uh, Shepparton, Seymour, um, then Echuca. Um, that's that peak coming down. And then we sort of expect it to kind of flatten a bit and then have quite potentially a higher peak towards late December at the border, uh, up higher. So we have a range there because it's still quite uncertain because of where that peak is in the, in the River Murray system upstream of the border. We say a high probability of them at least 185 gigalitres per day, moderate of say, 200, and potentially low chance of getting up to 220. Now, we always talk about flow at the border in South Australia because there's not really major tributaries coming into the river, and what happens is that flow will uh, generally tend to reduce a bit as it comes down the river. It will attenuate. There's losses from evaporation and things like that. So, to put in some context, um, the 1974 flood was measured at 182 gigalitres per day at the border. 1975 was 162. And both well, well smaller than the 1956 flood, which was 340 gigalitres per day, so almost twice the size. So the kind of flood water levels we're expecting, and you can look outside, um, is around that 1974 size flood, or potentially a bit bigger later in, in the month. Um, and when we use that flow, we can then sort of relate that to water levels at locations uh, down the river and uh, as a, an index, if you like, for understanding what the level will be at your location. Um, so there is some travel time down the river. So at the borders, we did say a forecast of that 170 to 180 around the 10th of December. Um, it's the sixth today. Uh, and the travel time down the River Murray it could be, well, it is variable, but it, it could be like three or, four, three or so weeks to get down the river, um, and probably a, couple, um, a week or so to get to here, and the information is available on our website. So what, well, just go into what information that we have, and then we might talk about some of the nuances that are occurring. So that forecast information, um, we have go into a bit more detail about what the flow is doing. Uh, all this information is available via sa.gov.au. 
but the Department for Environment and Water produces a flow report on a Friday. It's been subscribed to that. It talks about what the flow is doing. But importantly, also, this information is available elsewhere as well. We go have um, tables of uh, water level at various locations. And they're predicted for the range of flow rates that we're talking about uh, because uh, it's still a bit uncertain what's going to happen later on. And so we're still providing that range of different water levels for different flow rates depending on what we get. Um, and as Brad mentioned before, and I'm going to want you to just stick in your head really, really firmly, is that it has been 47 years since the last flood. Every flood is different. We, are, we know there has been changes. It's been really, it's almost impossible for us to quantify how that would affect flood levels, and we are starting to see some of those changes occur. So while we've given predictions, and we've also given flood maps, so those tables have uh, both historic water levels at locations along the river, as well as modelled water levels for a range of flow rates coming down the river, and the corresponding water levels at different towns. There's also flood maps that match those from that modelling. They have been calibrated to historic events. And I know myself, when we look at the historic events, the numbers don't always line up the way you'd expect them to do. So much variability in the river for these really high flows. So that's information is a guide. Uh, it's the best information we have available, but it is really, really tricky. It's been nearly 50 years since the flood, and you look outside and you see when the water gets up this high, it goes everywhere. It can be relatively easy to measure water level. We are starting to see challenges actually now in that some of our water level stations, because the velocity in the river is quite high, we've had to take some out, and that's proven challenges at alternative ways to measure. But importantly, it's extremely challenging to measure flow. It's nice and tidy when it's all staying in the river channel, but in situations like this, it's going everywhere. And we are right now, as it does appear as if the flow is peaking at the border around about now. So we did say the 10th, but it looks like it's peaking around about now, and the water level is stabilising. We are in the process now of checking various water level gauges and flow, so on-site gauging, which is actually a typical thing that you would do uh, in times of flood anyway as, as a water agency, is get out there and put the stick in the velocity meter in the river and go, well, what's going on here? So you can get those relationships between level and flow. So that process is happening now to, to build some confidence in, in the measurements that have been taken, both by upstream and here. Um, but we are seeing some, some things not line up. And you'll, I don't know if you've seen the, the uh, social media last week about uh, levels at Renmark uh, exceeding 1974 levels at the town. And we are seeing some flows uh, at the border peak at the moment. We've also had a gauging station upstream uh, at the one at Wentworth, which was reporting very high flows and the one further down was a bit low. So some of those things, are, we're going through a process right now of just building confidence in some of those flow measurements and the like. But while the, the Renmark level uh, was probably a bit of a surprise at the time to see that it had exceeded 1974 level already. Interestingly, up at the border, further upstream, uh, the, the levels have only just reached a 1974 level. In other places, it's a bit lower. So these things don't always... You, you don't quite know if it's a local factor. Maybe, maybe uh, parts of the, the channel were more deeper or shallower last time. So, so the, the, we, we are seeing across the board that some bits are higher, some bits are lower. Renmark was a, a case where we, we thought it looked higher, but we're now starting to unpick and see what's going on there. Um, so those things will play out in the days and weeks ahead as we see how this peak travels down the river. So now, it's, now this first peak has, has got to the state and we start to see it move down, then we can start to build our confidence in what we're going to see in the weeks ahead to see uh, if the levels are going to be very similar to what we forecast or, or drastically different. Um, uh, Renmark itself, even though that 74 level was reached um, at lock five, uh, the, um, it's around 18.15 at the moment. We had predicted around 18.2 for a 180 gigalitre per day flow. So there's variability, but there's also, it's still within that range of uncertainty, if you like. You know, we would expect, if when you look at that table and you see those water levels, you know, we're looking at sort of plus or minus 20 or 30 centimetres in some places because of that uncertainty of how the ripple channel has changed and uh, 
and also, importantly, uncertainty in the measurement of flow. So we, we'll, we're going to work through that in the weeks ahead to be able to understand better uh, what the flow is, very, various points is. Um, we measure flow at the border, but the next spot that you measure um, higher flows is not till overland corner. Now, lower flows we do measure at the locks, but we can't do that when the river's as high, because the water is going down multiple anna branches everywhere. So we have to put that information together and then continue to inform yourselves, the community, about what we expect the water levels to be, and we will continue to update that uh, on the resources that we have on our uh, linking via sa.gov.au. So now that that peak is coming into South Australia, we're going to narrow down some of those uh, forecast water levels at towns. But for the time being, this week still, uh, there's that second peak behind it, which is not quite certain what that's going to do. It's at a place at the moment called the Waikul Junction. It's just upstream where the Murrumbidgee comes in, and then also upstream where the Darling River comes in. So it's, it's looking like it's going to stay flat. It's, it's going to have a high river, flat river for a bit, and then you add in those other river uh, inputs into it to get the flow at, at South Australian water. Uh, still looking like late December, but we will um, continue to uh, discuss with our uh, water monitoring agencies upstream and the Murray Island Basin Authority and see how that tracks down the river and continue to provide advice along the way about what we think is happening. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's close with, a, with a, few, a few unexpected things, but it is generally travelling the way that we would expect. Finally, I'm just going to touch on, um, on black water. So you may have heard about Blackwater before, it's a natural phenomenon where flood water spread out over uh, large floodplain areas, forested areas, pick up leaf flit and the like, and bring that organic matter back into the river where uh, microorganisms and such will consume that organic matter. And in doing so, they suck the oxygen out of the water, you consume all the oxygen, which is bad for fish. Fish uh, need oxygen to survive, as well as crayfish and yabbies and the like. Um, a few weeks back with the major flooding upstream in East South Victoria, there were some major instances of blackwater. I'll, I'll narrow that down, hypoxic blackwater. Hypoxic meaning uh, low oxygen. Um, so we have been on the alert for a blackwater event entering South Australia like it did in the 2016 floods, the 2011 floods. There is reduced uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in the water in the Murray currently but not quite to the extent that we would have it being a, a black water event. So up at the border, SA Water does some uh, uh, regular monitoring. Uh, typically, dissolved oxygen in the rivers around sort of 7 to 10 or 11 milligrams per litre. Below 4, fish start to get stressed. Below about 2, they, you know, they start to be some you know, fish deaths generally, depending on the species. Our large-bodied native fish like uh, cod, Murray cod seem to be the most uh, vulnerable. Uh, it hasn't been, we haven't seen it in, in, a, uh, in a, a severe way yet in South Australia. We have seen some dirty coloured water, but that's not hypoxic black water because that's a special definition of own, but the, uh, the level of uh, uh, oxygen content. Um, we can, uh, but we're keeping an eye on that, and, but there's not a great deal we can do about it. We can, do a small amount of mitigation, but not really that much at all. It is a natural event. It's good for the environment and that circulates carbon back into the, into the food web, but the downsides are potential for fish kills. Um, but also, it can be really smelly. Um, it, it, if you're having to use river water for things like washing clothes and stuff, it's, it's not, not pleasant. It's a, a very um, tea, dirty colour. Um, but that's something we're monitoring closely, and um, if that does occur, then, then um, we'll, we'll provide some advice about that. Uh, that was everything I was going to uh, chat with you today, but I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Dylan Strong, the CEO of the Berry Barmer Council, to take the lecture. Thanks, Di, and good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, just tripping over the plug on the floor here. Um, uh, yeah, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm Dylan Strong, and I work for the Berry Barmer Council. Uh, there's a few things that I'd like to have a bit of a chat to you about today. Uh, firstly, 
I realise some of you may have already been to one of the community information sessions held previously in Cobb Dogla and in Berry, um, but some of you may not, so I thought I would give you uh, some background in terms of Council's approach to date uh, with regard to flood preparedness. I'd like to talk to you about our levy network uh, and uh, the remediation and construction activities that are happening on that. Uh, I'd also like to touch on some of the temporary levy systems, which some, depending on whereabouts you live in our wonderful region, you may or may not have seen um, and explain their purpose. Uh, and then lastly, I'll, I'll just touch on, um, on uh, the public safety front as well. Um, so to take a step back, um, it doesn't actually seem like that long ago when we were talking about flow rates of about 40,000 per day. And um, I think uh, that was only in August that we had um, flows of about that, so that's 40, 40 gig um, per day. And so you can, you can understand that between that time and now, um, the space in which Council has operated, the space in which we have needed to take action, has changed quite substantially. Um, I think it, it goes without saying that uh, Council's priority first and foremost was for the protection and safety of our community, but along with that uh, go the, uh, the, the essential infrastructure, the critical infrastructure that, that we require to continue as a, as a society and to live here comfortably. Um, the community facilities uh, in which we operate for and on behalf of the community, uh, and of course property as well, both public, public property and, and private property, which includes some of our parks and reserves, etc. Um, so like, like all of you, um, we are uh, subject to the information that's available to us, um, and like all of you, we rely on um, the, the relevant state agencies, so the Department of Environment and Water um, have been providing Council readily with, with information um, in terms of flow rates, um, potential inundation mapping, etc. Uh, and it's, it's off the back of that information that Council is able to make informed decisions about what action we should be taking in areas relative to us. So early on in the, in the piece, uh, we began a process of uh, site assessment um, and infrastructure assessment. So we, we looked at um, those bits of infrastructure, such as, just as, as an example, a community wastewater management system, um, where those lines ran, uh, where there existed potential sumps or pumps which could be exposed to inundation. We looked at our parks and reserves, uh, those close to the, the waterfront, and, uh, and those which may be subject to inundation later on should the flows increase. And we did begin at, at that point as well uh, a process, a staggered process of, of site closures. Um, so uh, we, we were required to restrict access in the first sense to a, a number of our boat ramps, for instance. Um, as the water levels increased in Berry, we were, we were required to bund off the, the access to the wharf. Uh, the Berry uh, Marina, um, the uh, uh, boat ramp here uh, on Lake Bonney as well, the campgrounds sur surrounding Lake Bonney, uh, Martin's Bend as well, another one of our key reserves which we were progressively required to uh, restrict access to and, and to close. In terms of the assessment of the uh, levy network which exists in the council area. Um, it was a, a prioritisation process that council underwent and I'll, I'll talk more specifically about the levy network in, in a moment but um, to, to begin with um, the, the order of priority in which council considered the, the relative sites in the council district were by elevation or the lowest lying areas first. So as an example of what I'm talking about there, Cobb Dogla happens to be the lowest lying area in our council area, so that was number one on the list for council to have a look at both community infrastructure as well as private and public property, followed by Barmera and Lake Bonney, with particular reference to the area between the western side of Lake Bonney and Cobb Dogla, the area through there which um, is, is an effect, effectively a, a peninsula which um, stops at uh, Napper's Bridge which goes over the inlet to, um, to Lake Bonney. Uh, that was a particularly low-lying area which we wanted to have a look at. The Barmera foreshore, uh, Berry, 
uh, the riverfront, funnily enough, um, the Riverview Drive is what's remnant of the 1956 levy. So uh, when a lot of those levies were put into place, Riverview Drive actually sits on top of, roughly, where the 1956 levy was, was established. So we had a look at that. Some of the areas um, to the, uh, the east of the, the caravan park, out towards Martin's Bend in Berry. Um, you've got some low-lying areas on both sides of the row there. So the road itself is built up and you've got wetland on the riverside, and what would have, once upon a time, effectively been swamp, um, now horticulture blocks, etc. That's another area where we had a look at, followed by some, um, some smaller outlying areas in Winky, in priority order, Winky, Love Day, and Overland Corner. Now, the levy network um, is, uh, is segmented in our district. There's not one levy um, a line of, of levy that, that runs uh, and connects to, to provide protection. It uh, often surrounds those areas that are lowest lying. Some of the levies which existed or were put into place in 1956 still exist. Uh, some of them are in better condition than others. So council undertook a process of assessment of those levies. We engaged some uh, independent engineering advice and, uh, and continued to work with with SES and, and DU in relation to those levies and what would be required to remediate those that still existed to a level that they were suitable to sustain the flows that were forecast. Uh, and then also identify those areas where we may need to construct either new levies or temporary levies for as long as the flows last. Um, I'll, I'll start by speaking about the uh, Cobb Dogler levy, again in, in priority um, order. We've undertaken a, a, a five segment levy in Cobb Dogler. Some of it is remnant 1956 levy and other is temporary levy. So if anyone's from Cobby or have, have been down to Cobby recently, uh, you would have seen a, a flurry of activity, no doubt. Um, a temporary levy now connects to a, um, a remnant 56 levy which joins the highway and follows the riverfront, effectively, um, down towards Bruno Bay, across the front of the caravan park, and will, by the end of next week, connect to a remnant levy on the other side of Cobb Dogler, um, out past the former SA water site over Trussell Terrace, etc. And, uh, and that, the assessment for that um, was, as I said before, based on the, the needs uh, from elevation. Um, so the area was low, uh, and we considered the inundation mapping up until a, a certain point. The, uh, council, the, the approach of council to date has been to try and remain one step in front of the flows forecast. And what I mean by that is when, when the authorities were projecting a 100 gig a day flow, council was planning for a 140. When the flows increased to a 120, we were planning for a 160. 150, we planned for 200 and so on. So at the moment, the, the planning that has been undertaking and the construction work that is un being undertaken on our levy network is planned to a 250 gig a day flow. That's not because we anticipate 250 gig a day, but as you heard Chrissy explain before, the variables within that can be quite extreme. So it was important that we allowed ourselves a certain buffer zone at the, at the top of those levies to ensure that they were sustainable. And that's the process that's been undertaken in Cobby. It's also the process that's being undertaken on the Lake Bonnie levy, which extends from the highway, so the Sturt Highway, um, alongside Cobb Dogler, all the way north and includes Napa's Inlet into Lake Bonnie. So that, that has been a, a, um, a work in progress and um, my goodness, the, um, uh, the crews out there are working around the clock at the moment to ensure that we have a, a necessary baseline out there to have a level of protection those levies will become uh, what they call loaded or they'll come in, become engaged by water, flood water, as we continue to build on them. So we anticipate having a, a baseline through there of up to the bottom, the bottom end of the flow, which is 175 by the time it gets here, and we'll continue to work on that during December and in January as required. Uh, a lot of you, I'm sure if you 
keep tabs um, with either at the information available on council's website um, or by some of the other the local channels um, would be across the uh, temporary closure of the inlet to Lake Bonnie. And uh, as I explained before, that is essentially forming part of the northern section of that levee network. So the levee starts at the highway and runs all the way north to the inlet. It goes across the inlet and on the other side of Napa's Bridge, which bridges the, the inlet into Lake Bonnie, SES have actually assisted with installing some temporary levees there on top of the road so as to prevent any uh, damage to the road surface itself and keep the road open for our trucks and crews to bring material in for as long as possible uh, from the northern um, side of, of the inlet into the, the high ground on, on the other side of, um, of the, the inlet. Um, that work has been progressing and on Friday um, I can confirm that um, the, the two sides of that levee from either side of the network joined in the middle, meaning that the lake is now protected from further flood water. Uh, in relation to Berry, um, as I touched on before, Riverview Drive um, is the remnant uh, 1956 levee. Um, as the flows have increased, um, we've been working with SES to explore the installation of a def what they call a defence cell levy down there. Um, it's, it's essentially a, a temporary levy set up where a frame is established um, with a, uh, a recycled plastic side and then filled in the top. Um, they, they use that structure for, uh, for sea walls. They're, they're highly sustainable. Um, so we have secured through SES um, over a kilometre of defence cell, which will provide the necessary protection to the Berry Riverfront. It is not anticipated, with the current flow data available to Council, that that entire area would be subject to inundation, but there, there are areas along there that are low and would allow water to overflow River, Riverview Drive and fill on the, on the other side of the road. That's why the, the structure has been proposed in, in the way that it has. Um, and look, lastly, on the levee network, um, there is also remnant levee in both Winky, Loveday and Overland Corner. Um, and, uh, and I am aware that um, some extremely passionate uh, local residents, combined with the help of some volunteers, have been undertaking some work in those areas on those levees and also some self-protection as, we as well around homes, etc., on some of those horticultural blocks uh, where they may not be protected by a, a 56 levy. Um, lastly, before I wrap up, um, I just want to pick up on the, the point that um, the Brad made earlier in relation to the um, safe play uh, and recreation in and around flood water. Um, if any of you have been down to the riverfront recently, um, you would see that the water is absolutely racing through there. Add to that, there is significant submerged infrastructure now which is not visible from the foreshore at all. Um, so I must stress that those areas are, they do pose a significant risk to public safety. Um, the, uh, the lake, however, although the issues with infrastructure, submerged infrastructure along the foreshore is the same, so that there, there are um, dangers close to the shore, in alignment with the current restrictions of the Department of Infrastructure and Transport, the lake itself is still open for use, for recreation, outside of a 250 metre buffer zone which sits along the front of the, the lake foreshore. Um, the, the other note on, uh, on public safety, I must stress that all of our levy work, uh, whether it can be construction or remediation at the moment, they are active construction sites uh, and there are a number of road closures in place associated with them. Some of them are happening in very close proximity to residential areas as well. So I must stress the importance of uh, the safety signage that surrounds those sites. Please stay clear and be aware that there will be heavy machinery moving in and out of all of those areas. And lastly, and certainly by no means least, um, I'd like to extend some thanks and acknowledgement to um, all, of, all of my staff, all of my crews, um, whether they be admin, admin staff or, or operational staff, as well as the, the growing, seemingly growing number of volunteers that we have helping um, with our approach at the moment. 
the response from my staff, from the organisation, uh, from the community has been truly astounding, quite remarkable. And, um, and I, I sincerely thank you all for your support to date. Uh, it's not a, this, this whole process is not a sprint, it's a bit of a marathon and truth be told we're only just starting to see some of the impacts of the high water coming down. Um, and we are all in it together, we're in it for the long haul and um, please if you, if you uh, feel the need to reach out about any of, any of the matters that uh, I've spoken about today um, and that Council may be able to provide some assistance on, don't hesitate to get in contact. Thanks, Di. Thanks, Dylan. Um, our next speaker is from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Um, invite Tony Scarlett to come to the mic. Thank you, Di. My name is Tony Scarlett, and I, my role is the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator for the De uh, Department for Infrastructure and Transport, and I'm based out at Murray Bridge. I'll be giving you a brief overview of the impacts of this event to ferries, marine safety and state roads today. I have an information flyer available on the table over there, uh, which lists all the web pages and phone numbers th uh, that I might mention in my presentation, so I encourage you to pick that up while you're here. Our department's been involved in preparing and planning since August, and we've worked very hard to try to identify any marine and road issues that may occur during this event. We have carefully considered which roads may be subject to flooding and prepared plans and detour routes for when this may occur and have published them on our website for the public to view so they can prepare ahead of time. As many of you will already know, Book Penong Road closed last week once the water came up onto the roadway. We kept it open as long as possible but it was no longer safe to do so and due to our careful planning we were able to quickly close it once the decision was made. Morgan Road, just up the road here, um, is also closed to support the levee works that Dylan was mentioning, um, yeah, just along Napa's Bridge. Um, and that's to, um, they're doing that to protect critical infrastructure for their townships. We'll continue to monitor the other roads and we'll install traffic controls or close roads when needed to commu and communicate these changes through our social media and website as quickly as possible. All current road closures, including council roads, are listed on the Traffic SA website. As a few people have mentioned already, it's um, not safe to go into floodwaters, either as a pedestrian or to drive through floodwaters at any time. And if members of the public come across any dangers on the road, including floodwater, they can be reported 24 seven to the Traffic Management Centre on 1800 018 313. The ferries are also being closely monitored and we're also seeing some, some needing to be closed as the water comes over their highest landing point. Uh, the Lyrup and one of the Manon ferries closed last week and the Morgan and Swan Reach ferries are closing 7pm tonight. The Wakery ferries moved to its high landing so should be able to stay open for much longer. Pernong and the second Manon ferry are likely to close in the coming weeks. In some cases, the ferries have to close early as the roads leading to them become inundated and so the access to the ferry itself is no longer safe. All ferry closures will again be communicated via social media and through our website and you can check the ferry's operational status through our dedicated webpage. Some of you may have seen the recent vessel restrictions for the River Murray, which have been in place since the 23rd of November, advising that a four knot speed limit, which is commonly referred to as a fast walking speed, for any vessels operating within 250 metres of any property, partially or fully submerged, and within 250 metres of any levee, partially or fully submerged. The four knot limit also applies to all vessels operating at night or in restricted visibility. We're also finding that there's a, getting less and less places to launch any vessels. In addition, all personal watercraft, commonly referred to as jet skis, must not exceed four knots on any part of the River Murray. There is not to, there's also to be no swimming, bathing or diving within 250 metres of a lock or weir and no operating unpowered vessels within 250 metres of a lock or weir. This includes canoes, kayaks, surf skis, rowboats or other human powered vessels and aquatic toys. 
Vessel operators on vessels 12 metres and under are required to ensure that all passengers on board wear a level 50 or above life jacket while underway or a tanker. These restrictions apply from the South Australian border and down to the ferry landings at Wellington. The marine safety team ask all users of the River Murray to take care on or near the water and watch for hazards in the water. Our team have been marking out hazards with yellow buoys and signage and members of the public can report any hazards to our team via our website. As Dylan mentioned before, there are some hazards that are under the water, such as jetties and pontoons, and now even footpaths and walkways, um, which make them extra dangerous because they could be hidden. The best way to find the marine safety information is to Google marine safety, and it's the first link on the refine return search list. So if you identify a hazard that's under the water that isn't marked, please report it to us on our website so we can mark it. We have marine safety teams in the area all the time at the moment so that they can come and do that pretty quickly. As of the 1st of December, there's a new 50 metre exclusion zone around electricity power lines standing in the River Murray with floodwaters to help keep communities safe and avoid unnecessary disconnections. In general, it's highly recommended that all vessels stay away from the floodplain areas where possible. Should entry to the area be required, vessel operators must observe the 50 metre exclusion zone around power lines and infrastructure. Failure to adhere to this direction could result in prosecution and significant fines. People should always assume power lines are live and potentially lethal, and the risk is heightened in the presence of water. Avoiding the area is the safest course of action. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, next, I'd like to invite um, Barbara from Primary Industries up to the mic. Why is it always me? Hi, I'm Barb Cowie. I work for Primary Industries and Regions, and I'm based here in the Riverland. So um, uh, as we have been sitting here today, living and speaking um, what's going on. I've had SA Power Networks in the front of my house checking my, my line, so thank you for keeping me safe. Um, PERS are a part of the entire state response, and we are part of all elements of it in relief, response, and recovery. So as everybody's mentioned previously, this is a multi-pronged marathon rather than a sprint, and that's why we have all three elements um, running concurrently. Um, we've also um, uh, have mapped uh, the region, and we've mapped it above uh, all expectations to, to look at what the inundation area of our primary production land uh, potentially will be and what impacts we'll have. So from a primary industries perspective, our, our primary um, area of responsibility is all agricultural sectors. So um, we've, we've looked at it and we're fairly confident that we know, um, uh, based on the mapping, what will happen. However, as Chrissy and Dylan have also mentioned, the river is a dynamic, um, uh, it, it, it's dynamic and it moves and we can't be 100% sure. And so what we also do is if we have any, any concerns, we have any person from the, the community that raises an issue, we go out and we ground truth it. So we're driving around checking land as well so, and supporting our growers that way. We have a responsibility for animal welfare and on top of that we also have our... Um, so if there is any animals that anyone in the community sees that are stranded, or are not looked after in a way that's appropriate at the moment, we would really appreciate a phone call and we will work to make sure that they are saved. And I do believe we had a couple of... Uh, we've already been able to do some work in this area by saving a couple of goats. So, um, you know, it might sound small, but it's really important. Um, we also have three farm and business mentors on the ground and they're there to help anybody who um, might need it in a farm and business capacity to talk through put in touch with and link to anybody who, who might be needed. They're also there to just have a chat. So we have John Chase, Brent Fletcher and Robin Kane, all of which also live locally um, and all very approachable. All their phone numbers are on the website, so easily accessible also. 
On a day-to-day -day basis, we still have a fruit fly outbreak that we're trying to uh, get under control. We've got 16, currently we have 16 active sites. And to make sure that we could do the um, groundwork that's needed, we've actually relocated uh, uh, the majority of our on-ground team to the Riverland Field Day site. So you will see a lot of activity around the Field Day site where you will have um, our, our crews coming and going. Um, that is to, that's to make sure that accessibility was maintained and we could get to where we want. Having said that, um, because the SES has, has had a massive job door knocking, we've also um, been working with the SES and we have had a, a large contingent of, of our um, fruit fly team also helping with some of the door knocking, uh, just to, to make sure that people are aware that, that there is flood, find out where people are living and to work. Our team are still wearing the purple suits. They still have their ID, so if anyone uh, does get a door knock, please ask for the ID uh, just to verify that they are one of our staff. Um, we're also working with the Relief Centre, which has now been established in Berry, which I'm sure you're going to hear about. Um, and part of uh, our working with the Relief Centre is, um, as part of the current state government package, there is primary producer support in there. And we encourage anyone from the primary, produ any primary producer who, who might think that they're going to need some of this support to just register on the uh, an expression of interest. And once we get the guidelines, we'll, we'll be in touch. Um, we are also have the envious task of cleaning up fish kill. Um, as uh, Chrissy has mentioned, when we have black water that turns hypoxic and we have um, fish that do die, quite often it's uh, a lot of fish in a small area and they need to be cleaned up for obvious reasons. And so we, we, that is our responsibility. We already have in place um, a plan for that and we've activated as many of the current fishing licenses that are along the corridor uh, because they have the infrastructure, boats and, and nets and other things to actually um, come and work with us to collect. But we've also been working with other agencies and, and organisations for the removal and, and then the safe um, composting or, or uh, getting rid of the, the fish. Um, so in all, we're doing everything with everybody that we can, but we also don't know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. So we encourage anybody who's got any questions to give us a call. Um, we're, we have a hotline. Um, we will get back to you. Uh, we are on the ground every day, and um, we're here to work with all the other agencies as well. Thanks, Barb. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Kelly Lambert up from Housing SA. Oops. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today at your community meeting. It's great to see so many people getting information for this event, and that's the best way to be prepared. So well done, you guys, for attending, and hopefully others are live streaming so they get the information as well, or you could share it. Um, so yes, I am from the SA Housing Authority. Um, in an event like this, a disaster, we are activated to um, perform our relief function, which is a function we serve to look after people in an event. So we are the ones that open and mainly man, but we have other people, the um, relief centre, which is currently open in Berry, seven days a week, nine to five. What is the function of that relief centre? Well, that is a place for people to go um, for firstly, any physical needs that you might have. For example, there's um, many agencies in there that have grants, including us, we have grants available. Um, and that is a place where people who are impacted um, by their business or maybe from their um, personal accommodation um, can go to get some sort of relief, um, financial relief. So we also have um, a Department of Industry, Innovation and Science in there doing the generator grant. Um, and small business grant, and we have uh, hardship grants, accommodation grants, um, and there's others. Now, please look on the sa.gov.sa, sorry, .au website, go to the Murray River High Flow and go to the financial assistance part to have a look to see if there might be a grant suitable for you. But better than that, you can call the relief line and talk to someone if you'd prefer to, or come into the centre. 
The centre also performs another function, and that's emotional support. So you might not be impacted by the flood, or you may be, but you're going to feel pretty bad seeing community members that are impacted. You'll have a sense of guilt or um, what can I do? And that's a place to go where you can talk to people. We have Red Cross there um, for psychosocial support, and we also have disaster recoveries there for support as well. So even if you don't really want to chat, you just want to come in for a cup of tea, speak to some people, just briefly and have a sandwich, that's all there as well. So these centres are open for you. We also have one opening in Manham on Wednesday. Um, if anyone is around that way or knows someone that's that way that might be impacted, and it's just a great idea just to pop in and talk to the people that are there. It's, it's for the people impacted by the flood, and that would be you guys, so please attend the centre. Um, Hot Off The Press is another grant which isn't on the website at the moment, but for those people that absolutely have not been able to find alternative accommodation um, in this whole period, um, the Premier has announced today that um, we will have motel accommodation available where we can um, along the river for people. The aim is to try to keep people connected to their community and try to keep people in areas where they know the people at the main street and they know um, where their doctors is, where their kindergarten is, etc., etc. So this accommodation, if you haven't absolutely been able to find any accommodation yourself um, and you're impacted and cannot live at your residence, this may be something that is for you and you need to go to the relief centre to actually talk to someone to be eligible. Now, the rooms aren't ready yet. We only found out today, so we're madly... I've got a team of people calling and trying to make the bookings, but it's a short-term accommodation option to keep people safe. It'll just be small, you know, won't be able to bring your belongings, but it'll be something where it's um, dry and where you can just relax and wait for the, the waters to recede. Um, so, yeah, as I said, sa.gov.au website or call the relief line, or best yet, go and visit it, go to the um, centre in Berry, and just enter there and talk to people there till five o'clock every day. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Next up, we have Paul Irwin from SA Power Network. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my business, SA Power Networks, we've been monitoring flood levels for a significant period of time now, uh, watching the, the event unfold um, and actively looking at what it is that we need to do to um, impact the least amount of people as possible, which is our continual drive through this whole process, to impact the least amount of people. But inevitably, at stages, we will need to take supply off where there is a risk of electric shock or inundation of, of water. Um, we've had our plans in place and they're in conjunction with all of the other agencies that you see up here. So all of our modelling has been about the suggested inflows that are coming in and those inflows that are predicted to occur later on during the, the next peak of this event. Probably goes without saying that the lower lie regions are the ones that are obviously at the risk of flooding, therefore they're at the most risk of, of being disconnected. In our efforts so far, what we've been looking to do is individually disconnect properties and homes instead of a bulk disconnection taking place of, of a low lying area. So we've been going out to individual homes, individual properties, individual businesses to take them off. We've been able to do that quite successfully up until this stage. Um, as water levels continue to rise, if they rise more rapidly, that might beat us to our ability to do that. So you may find that there are larger groups of areas that go off because we just can't get in to do this individual disconnection. Recovery and restoration of supply is likely to be more challenging for us uh, once the floods recede. Um, it's easy to go in and disconnect under clear skies with uh, a road that hasn't been impacted and go and do the work. When flood waters recede, it's really going to come down to our accessibility to get out to some of these properties that we've disconnected so far. Uh, we may come across and find that roads have actually been washed away or they're covered with so much debris that you've got to wait for some of the other agencies to look to clear them before we can get through to you. 
uh, let alone the fact that some of these areas are going to be quite boggy once waters recede and we need to wait for things to dry out till you can get through to property. So we just ask for your patience during that time. We are trying to provide as much notice as possible to properties if we do need to disconnect. We can't do that all of the time because sometimes under an emergency situation we just need to disconnect while we're there. I just ask you, there's a, a set of these flyers uh, on the table um, down that end of the hall here. I'd ask you to pick one of those up if you don't have one of those or if you're not subscribed to our SMS service already. There's a QR code on this for those that know how to use QR codes. Uh, I, I don't. So there's also a number here uh, that you can call, uh, 131261. You can call us on that number. We'll take you through the process to sign you up for these SMS updates. If you already get notifications from us when you have a storm about power going out and power being restored, you're already signed up to this service, so you don't need to do anything. If you don't get any of those sort of notifications, I encourage you to sign up to it. That's how we're going to communicate with you through the event. When flood levels have come up, it's going to restrict some of the access that we would need through roads and tracks to get through and do that individual disconnection that I talked about. So at times when that does occur, there'll be potentially more customers going off than we'd like to have go off. So water might not be at your door, but it's going to be at other people's door that, that feeds that same sort of line that, that you're on. We'll do our best to minimise those impacts to people, but in some cases there will be those impacts. If you are disconnected, uh, we will advise your electricity retailer that the property is being disconnected. This will stop any bill coming to you for an estimate during that period when you're just not there um, and you just haven't used any energy. So you don't want a nasty surprise like that coming through the mail. Um, we'll also advise your retailer when we've come in and reconnected your property again as well. If you're a local business um, that hasn't already engaged uh, an electrical contractor to help try and shift pumps or switchboards or anything out of the water, um, we'd urge you to get in contact with us if it's not too late to actually do some of that work. Uh, there's a group of people here in the room today uh, wearing high vis or SA Power Network's monogram shirts. I'd encourage you to come up and, and talk to us about that. Um, ask your electrician to put in their job the, that it's the River Murray flood and we'll expedite any work that we need to do to try and do what we can to, to not impact you. Um, if you know of a business or a primary producer that you think is going to be impacted that's not at this meeting here today, we'd ask you to reach out to them as well and uh, urge them to contact us if they can. We want to do everything we can to assist where we can, we don't want to see the economic prosperity of the community impacted. Uh, we just want to minimise everything that we can in, in that place uh, because we understand some of those businesses will be impacted. Uh, and there's a group of people here whose livelihoods will depend on that as well. If you're not sure even about the SMS service, I just urge you to leave your details on the, on the um, butcher's paper on the wall. We'll take that and sign you up for that service as, as well. From a safety perspective, um, the question may be asked, why do we disconnect? Um, our poles and wires that you see in the street are at a height for a certain reason. And it's not just to aesthetically keep them out of the way. There's very high voltages running through those lines. Um, and as you start to decrease those distances by introducing a new level of water, so you decrease the level of distance that exists at the moment, you start to introduce the risk of shock. Uh, to people. And we don't want to see that there is a death or somebody that's catastrophically injured because we haven't taken steps to disconnect when those clearance distances become too low. The good news is the 50 metre exclusion zone that the Department of Infrastructure and Transport, Tony, just spoke to, that's a good piece of news for us. We've also had the Office of our Technical Regulator um, reassess what is a safe distance for um, power lines and the clearances to be at due to that new 50 metre exclusion zone, which means we'll be able to keep power on to a lot more people than we originally would have been able to. So that's 
good news out of, out of this. I just ask you if your property is likely to be flooded, flooded, that you make it electrically safe if you can now before the waters rise. Um, and that's, I'm probably telling you things that you already know, it's about switching off electrical appliances, either taking them with you somewhere safe or raising them above what will potentially be the water line. We ask you to turn off your main electrical switch at the switchboard if you're going to be impacted. And if you have solar panels, um, we'd ask you to turn off your solar panels. Uh, if you're not sure how to do that, just call us on the phone number that's at the bottom of that flyer on 13 12 61 and we'll take you through the process on how to do that. You may come back to your property if you haven't done that and find that your solar system has been damaged um, due to those floodwaters. You've paid a lot of money for these systems so you want them to be operating and working when you, when you come back. The same if anybody here has a battery. Um, I know there's probably not a lot of those that have been sold across the state but if you have a lithium ion battery that you think is going to be inundated with water you'd need to remove that from water. They've been shown to explode when they're immersed in water. So again you've paid a lot of money if you've installed one of those so best to remove it. If the water level reaches your lower lying general power outlets, the ones around your skirting boards or the outside of your home uh, and it impacts those, we'd encourage you to get an electrician in to have a look at your property once flood water is to recede just to make sure that it's safe. If the flood water comes up to your switchboard and inundates your switchboard you'll need to get a certificate of compliance from an electrician. Again you'll need to get an electrician out just to make sure that it is, is safe. If you come back to your home and you feel any tingling in the taps when you use them, tingling in your bath, bathroom taps or your shower taps or your kitchen taps, we just urge you to contact us immediately. That means that there's a problem with the supply. Um, if we can rectify it, we'll rectify it. If we can't do that, we'll get you to contact your electrician. They'll need to come in and do some work inside your home to rectify it. But that's something important that you'll need to let us know. I know that we've talked a lot about boats travelling in, in floodwaters here. Um, there's that 50 metre exclusion zone. Uh, you should never consider that any electric electrical infrastructure is dead. I'd always consider it to be alive, so we ask you not to go anywhere near it. And typically for us, we sort of, even though it's a 50 metre exclusion zone, we suggest you stay 150 metres away, the length of the local football field from goal line to goal line. So you might be asking yourself, what can you do uh, here outside of uh, applying for that SMS service, we just ask you to talk to your neighbours, your friends, the businesses in this area that, that haven't applied for that SMS service and encourage them to do so, so that we can keep communicating with people through the event and then look to give you some instruction about what to do when floodwaters recede and you need to, to come back to us for a reconnection. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'd like to invite Joshua up from SA Water. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just touch on uh, water services a little bit and I've got a couple of very practical call outs, uh, things that I'd like you to think about and action for us over coming days. So first of all, I just want to be very clear up front and specify that there are currently no interruptions to any of SA Water's drinking water services across the state at the moment. Okay? But as the flood progresses, there is the potential that that could change and that there could be interruptions or changes to your drinking water services. So I want to explain a little bit about why that could be the case and what you can do there to help prepare for that as well. So when we talk about drinking water, we think about drinking water quality and then supply. So firstly, just thinking about quality, what's the main concern or the thing that we think about in this space? That's thinking about the raw water in the river and the quality of that because that's the water supply which we treat to make the clean, safe drinking water that goes through the network to your taps. So as Chrissy and Barb have both touched on, uh, black water is the kind of consideration that we think about in this space. Uh, but whereas it might have a different impact for uh, fish or animals living in the water, it's a little different for our drinking water supplies. 
because we have the water treatment plants located all along the river, which are designed and equipped to treat that raw water to make it clean and safe to drink. And they're designed to cope with challenges in water quality to remove a lot of the organic material and uh, contaminants that might be in there. However, when we see the raw water deteriorate to this kind of level, if we had a black water event, and again, just to reinforce uh, what Chrissy said, we do not currently have black water in South Australian sections of the river, but it might be possible. Uh, but uh, the treatment plants are equipped to cope with that, but they would be put under additional stress and so whereas under normal circumstances, they could likely remove all of that organic material and you wouldn't notice a difference. In this circumstance, they might not be able to completely remove some of the organic compounds in there. Now, what does that translate to in a practical sense for you and I at home when we turn on the tap? Is essentially, there might be a small change in the taste and odour of the drinking water. And by that I mean it might just have a slightly earthy or musty smell to it or taste to it. It will still be treated to a standard that is clean and safe and it will be disinfected. And the ability of each of us to actually notice or detect that earthy, musty um, compound varies between every one of us in this room. So some of you might notice it immediately and probably about 90% of you would never notice it or notice a difference there. But that's the kind of quality concern that we need to manage and that we talk about. In terms of supply, the potential concern or scenario there would be if one of the water treatment plants was completely inundated uh, by floodwaters or uh, completely lost uh, power supply and was unable to operate. So there are a range of things that we've been doing to prepare for any of those scenarios things like um, sandbagging and building levees or strengthening existing protections. Most of the water treatment plants are actually located well above flood levels, so it's not really a concern. The supply issue isn't one that I'm terribly worried about today for us here. Okay? The other things that we've been doing to prepare are really for overcoming those kind of access challenges if roads are uh, inaccessible uh, or if um, power supply needs to be disconnected for safety reasons. Uh, and that's by making sure that we've got enough extra storage on site for any of our treatment chemicals as well as some backup generation and pumping and that kind of thing. So we're implementing all of those measures so that we're as confident as we can be that we'll be able to maintain supply. Now the other uh, side of our business is wastewater. Now in this area, uh, that's managed by councils, so I would encourage you to be making sure that you're aware of what council's done uh, if you're connected to the Community Wastewater Management Scheme or if you need to take any action if you might have a standalone septic system. Now if you are um, in an area where you're expecting water to come into your home, uh, then please grab one of the SES sandbagging fact sheets because it actually has a really great practical guide on there. It's very important that you think about putting a sandbag within your toilet, putting it in a, probably a garbage bag, so a plastic layer of protection and putting that inside of the toilet as well as over the top of floor drains. And that's to prevent anything that might be in the sewerage network of pipes below your house or wherever you're connected to um, being pushed up by flood water or groundwater as it infiltrates that network. Now, uh, if we actually end up having any kind of interruption or um, issue with water quality or supply, we will be very proactively trying to let you know about that and we'll be letting you know what's happened, what we're doing about it, and if we need you to actually do anything to help us manage that situation. So please look to uh, traditional and social media, so listen to the radio, uh, watch the TV news, um, also look to social media. But the other thing, and here's my practical request of you, is just like you can sign up for service interruptions for SA Power Networks for your electricity supply, you can also sign up for SMS notifications for service interruptions to your water supply. So you can do that by visiting sawater.com.au. It's available from the front page of the website. You can also call us on 1300 SA Water, and you get a real person in Adelaide who can um, register you for that service as well. 
The other thing that I would just like you to think about for preparation is in exactly the same way that you'd have your first aid kit, you know, some changes of clothes, some torches, batteries, that kind of thing, is making sure that you've got some drinking water set aside as well, uh, in the pantry, probably in the car as well, if you're in an area where you know you might need to leave. So you probably need to be making sure that you've got an initial supply of at least 20 litres per person for the household. So a really big jerry can, if you haven't got one already, be heading down to the hardware store and grabbing one of those, fill that up with a tap and make sure that you've got that in the pantry or in the car so that you know if by some chance there is a water supply interruption that you at least have some supply on standby to get you through those first few days until we might have some guidance or we might have got something back up and running normally again. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Um, thank you, speakers. That brings our information session to a close. And I'm hoping that many of the questions that you may have had have already been answered. So thank you for that. I'm now going to open the floor to questions. The format for this session is that Michael will be taking this microphone. Unfortunately, our other one is not working. And he will be roving with the microphone to pick up questions. Um, we will monitor the live stream questions as well and ask them. Now, I do ask that when you are asking a question, please stand so that you can still be seen on live screen, stream and also use the mic so that everybody can hear you. I also ask that we only have one question per person, please, so that we can give as many community members as possible the opportunity to raise their concern. Um, and also, although we have a wonderful um, collective group of fantastic people, we really need to keep the questions flood related in relation to this event. So thank you. Let's go. I, I live in Cobdogla. Now, you've all talked about people being displaced. I have got two dogs. Um, is anything being done for people to be accommodated with their animals? Because I cannot put my dogs into kennels. They have to be with me. So is there anything being done to accommodate people that have got dogs? That's a really important question and thank you. Um, we, are work we have been working with all the other agencies to make sure that in that situation we can find a solution. Um, we, obviously it's a case by case, but if that is the case, we will definitely be working with you to make sure that you and your animals can stay together if at all practically possible. The challenge we do have, as everybody in this room would know, is that accommodation in our region is really limited at the best of times. And so, unfortunately, we may not be able to do that locally. That's, that's our biggest issue. Uh, thank you. I, th th thank, thank you. Um, mine, mine is not so much a question. Uh, I think one of the problems we've got is um, no one yet from the town, as I believe, has been able to make any sort of statement. And I'm just wondering if this would be an opportunity for me to, uh, to make. It's a reasonably short statement, but uh, perhaps this is opportune uh, and perhaps some information uh, for those that are here today.
Yes, I would like to make a statement. Thank you. Uh, just a few notes here that I've got and I've made a mainly during the, today. First of all, I'll introduce myself at John Beach. Uh, most of you probably know me. Uh, I am a supporter and one of the Lake Bonnie Save Lake Bonnie group. Um, first I'd like to say uh, I've, I've been here all my life. I worked on the 1956 flood bank which was around Cobb Dogla, Cobb Dogla area and of course there was a small flood bank at Barmera. Uh, Barmera Town of course, uh, unlike Cobb Dogla, Barmera Town is uh, basically above flood level. Uh, I guess that's, you know, one of the things we can thank our forefathers for. But having said that, of course, we're on the lake, uh, and the only reason Barma Town is here, we're, that the lake is here, otherwise we'd be Mallee Bush or maybe a vineyard. Um, a lake Bonnie is very unique. It's part of the River Murray system. Uh, but it's only one inlet, uh, and one uh, which is an out, also an outlet. So we have a bit of a problem with uh, we having a water flow, uh, and we do uh, we rely on flood events particularly to refresh the lake. So we welcomed. Uh, we expect floods. Um, we welcomed the 1974-1975 uh, floods. Uh, they did give the lake a good flush out. Uh, the salinity dropped right down. There is a slight salinity problem with the lake. It seems to cope, but uh, we do rely on floods to really push that salinity down. You can probably see where I'm coming from. So we welcome a flood. And we do condemn the annexing of the lake from the river because the lake is part of the river system. And I do believe legally that that should not be annexed ever from the river system because it is the river system. So the town is extremely angry about that. We've seen it before. It was annexed for the opposite reason. There was little water in the river. It was annexed in not, uh, 2007 and we saw we saw the damage that happened when it was blocked off then I believe and having been here in 1956 and seen where the flood level was I think the prudent thing would have been due to extend the the caravan park have got the levee there extended along there what's that about a kilometre of flood bank and that would have kept Barmer safe. You talk about the infrastructure. Well, if you put infrastructure on a floodplain, it's going to be flooded. So more for you if it's not secured against flood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Hunt from Barmer. Maybe to Chrissy. And we spoke about the peaks. And I was sitting over there, you may have said, but during these peaks, are we going to see the water recede? Or do you think it'll stay perhaps where it is? And just on another one, while you're at it, was there a um, pipe installed in the actual blood blank? out by Napa's Bridge, where it could perhaps be with a gate valve allow water to come in. Well, answer the first part of the question only, and I'll hand over to Dylan for the second part. Um, looking at the uh, water level gauges upstream, it appears that this first peak is 
only very slightly go down afterwards and then flatten out and then rise again. But we do expect, based on what the water levels are doing upstream, it's going to stay fairly flat, then kind of increasing uh, towards late December at the border, and then probably see that same pattern travel down further downstream. But certainly looking at it upstream at water levels at uh, Mildura and Houston, it's been flat for, and, and Walpole Junction, it's been flat for weeks, flattish, up and down slightly. So um, uh, one thing I didn't mention before is that we are expecting these flows to hang around for a while, probably above <clears throat> quite higher levels, like similar to this for uh, into February, uh, and then, uh, sorry, end of January, then, and even above 100 gig a day, well, uh, towards the end of February. So we are expecting the river to stay quite high like this for, for a period of a, a couple of months. Thanks, Peter, for your question. Um, look, the, uh, the structure of the, uh, the levee that crosses Napa's inlet um, is the sa of the same construction as the rest of the levee bank. So I understand that um, in the early uh, process of, of designing that levy, that different alternatives were looked at to see whether a, uh, either, either a pipe, as you say, or some, some form of regulator that could continue to allow water into the lake was looked at. Um, however, uh, with respect to the, the time available before peak flows, and also the sheer velocity of the water um, in Loch Luna and entering the lake, it wasn't feasible to, to install a, a, a gate valve, as you say. Um, I, I would follow that up by saying that Council are working uh, very proactively with the Department of Environment and Water about what a reopening strategy looks like for the temporary levy that's been in, installed at, at the inlet, um, and that work uh, commenced immediately um, upon uh, SES's decision to proceed with the, the closure of the, the inlet. Um, it isn't anticipated that the temporary levy should uh, have to remain in place for any more than six to eight weeks, dependent on flows, obviously. Uh, and I am advised at the moment that um, the moment the water recedes to a, a, a safe level, um, and that doesn't mean that an equal level between Loch Luna and, and the lake, but as soon as it recedes to a level that it is safe to, to open, um, even in a, in, a, in a staggered process, uh, that that will commence. So come the end of January, I fully anticipate that we will be actively pursuing the removal of that, that levee bank subject to the, the flows. Hello. I just want to know whether the water in Lake Bonnie itself is being monitored. Uh, there's already a lot of vegetation all around the bank. There's dead fish around the bank as well. Is that quality water safe to swim still and who's monitoring it and where would we get that information? Um, there's only um, there's one site I believe um, uh, sort of active in, in the lake. Um, we have taken some uh, ad hoc monitoring when required or when requested, or something has come up over the last few weeks to to uh, to check um, water quality within the lake. Um, we'll continue working with the SES IMT uh, to identify uh, if there's um, a need to to get out on the lake um, and, and take more um, readings of. Uh, salinity or other water quality parameters um, on an as-needs basis. Thank you, absolutely. That's a um, very good question. So yes, we'll be working with all parties involved with the lake to understand what those risks are. We'll be working with DEW um, and local council, understand their monitoring strategies that are required to make sure that the lake is still safe and what's occurring um, with the environmental impacts with the lake. And we will absolutely make sure that's communicated out with the community and how what that communication strategy looks like. We'll make sure everybody's across it in the coming, in the coming weeks. 
I just want to take up the fish issue. If um, you are seeing significant fish coming up on the shores, can you please let the fish watch line know or alternatively, I'm happy to give you my card as well so you can just give me a call. But we do need to monitor that, monitor that and um, make sure that they remain small rather than large fish kills. Look, my, my understanding is that there is no uh, restriction other than those safety issues that I outlined earlier in, in relation to the, the submerged infrastructure which exists there. Um, I'm not sure whether the department would like to add anything to that, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly not aware of anything to suggest that the, the water is not safe for those, those normal activities. I just have a question from the live stream from Carolyn, and she's asking, where is the wastewater system near Lake Bonnie? Um, the, the wastewater network is one of the key pieces of infrastructure um, that the, uh, the closure of the inlet into, like the temporary closure of the inlet into Lake Bonnie um, is designed to protect. Um, a lot of the system um, is, is quite historical and it dates back to time that, uh, to times where uh, wastewater would naturally find its way down the hill and alongside the lake. Um, but the section of network that runs right along the foreshore, uh, very close to the, the waterline, actually supports the Barmer Township as well as Cobb Dogler and Loveday. Um, so the reason that it was uh, essential infrastructure for council to protect uh, was because it effectively supports up to 4,000 residents. If that network were impacted, be it the main line, be it the sumps or the pumps that exist along that foreshore, there's no alternate route out to the, the wastewater lagoons, which are out towards Monash. So effectively what that means is that uh, people would have wastewater issues uh, backed up into their homes and, uh, and from a health perspective, it may not be possible for people to remain in their homes. Thank you. Um, I'm coming from a different direction. I, I grew up here and lived at Cobdogler. I was there during the 56 flood. And um, so I've been under, along with a lot of other people, but under a lot of anxiety, not knowing how high the river was going to be, whether we were going to have to evacuate our homes, whether we were going to have the power cut off and things like this. But having every night now, my daughter and I go down to the flood banks and have a look to see how far the water's come up. And I'd like to say a very, very special thank you to the Berry Barmera Council for the banks they've installed at Cobdogler because they are brilliant. They are twice the size of the, the uh, flood banks that we had at Cobdogler in 1956. And, um, the, uh, you know, I don't believe there's any way in the world that our town is in danger anymore. And the other thing is, I'd like to thank the other councils who have um, come up to help build our flood banks around our town. Thank you very much. Hello, my name's Danny, this one for you, Paul. Uh, you represent uh, SA Power Network. What about the uh, transmission side? Is that going to be impacted? Uh, from our assessments, no, not at this stage. We don't expect that to be impacted for these sort of flood levels. Um, if you're someone here in this community that is wondering, am I going to be impacted? How will that impact uh, me? I've got uh, two of the, our reps from SAP Network sitting in the front row here in Kim and Brenton who have some maps. Uh, happy for you to approach us after the, um, the meeting and we can show you individually how those impacts will assess or will hit you at different water levels. We haven't publicised a lot of that information. Um, we know 
further upstream through New South Wales and Victoria, there'd been looting occur um, at people's homes. So that's why we've started that SMS service. We want to deal with you individually, one-on-one, -on -one, without making it public and giving someone a blueprint of which homes are on and which aren't on. Unlike the case for um, a storm or something like that, you don't leave your home. When there's a storm, you wait for the power to come back on. In some of these circumstances, people might be gone for weeks or even months. So if you're concerned and you want to have a look, um, we're happy for you to come up afterwards. Thank you. Look, that will bring our meeting to a close and we have gone over time. Um, hopefully your questions have been answered, but I would like to thank the speakers for responding to your questions. I'd also like to thank the council so much for setting up the venue for us. But primarily I would like to thank you, the community members, for making your time to come out and to um, listen and keep yourselves informed. And hopefully you have got information and you'll know where to go to contact people. As Brad mentioned earlier, um, the safety of our community members is our number one priority. And I would, I would really encourage everybody to consider their own personal safety and, make, and your safety and your wellbeing and your mental health and make that your number one priority. So our speakers have offered to stay away, around for a little bit if you want to ask some one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, some of them, of course, we've taken up more time than we had intended to. So please, if you have specific questions you'd like to ask, they'll be around for a little bit. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>